Hi, everybody. This is Steve Ludwig, host of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture at PlanetLudwig.com. Here's an interview we did with Stanley Livingston, Chip Douglas, from the My Three Sons TV show. Back on December 10th, 2014, it was show number 70. To hear the entire show, check out the menu at PlanetLudwig.com. And now, please enjoy the interview. Well... That theme song everyone is so familiar with, and our next guest is one of the most beloved TV actors, uh, movie actors in uh, in television history and movie history. He's a true Renaissance man. He's an actor, producer, director, writer, an editor, cinematographer, and an artist. And we're going to be talking about his art in just a few moments. It's a real pleasure to. Welcome to the show, Mr. Stanley Livingston. Stan, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Steve. Thanks, and, uh, thanks for having me. Come on. <laughs> it, it's such a pleasure. Uh, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll get to my three sons, of course, uh, in a few minutes, but what always excites me when I have, uh, when I have guests such as, such as yourself, uh, who, whom we've grown up with on TV, and you have so many projects going on. You're such an interesting guy. Can we talk about some of those first, and then we'll get to my three sons? Sure, however, whatever order you want to do it in. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, <clears throat> what I was really, uh, um, really, really impressed with is, first of all, your, your artwork at uh, StanleyLivingstonArt.com. Uh, how far back do you go with your interest in art? Well, that actually stems back to the My Three Sons Day. Uh, as you know, when you're uh, working on a soundstage, uh, there isn't a whole lot you can do uh, where you can make noise. So when I was a kid, my mom bought me, you know, some pencils, paints, and said, here, here's something to do where you'll be nice and quiet, and anyway, over the years, I learned how to paint and draw, you know, uh, did that actually the whole time I was on My Three Sons, which ran 12 years, so I uh, had a lot of time to practice, but I got pretty good at, you know, acrylics, oil, watercolor, and um, I guess I had some sort of innate ability as an artist, nobody else in my family, they were all drawn stick people, so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're, just all, kind they're of, all playing hangman, right? <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Yeah, Barry, uh, she say, how come you can make all I can draw these stick people? <laughs> you know, I, I feel Barry's pain because my brother, Stanley, uh, graduated from the Art Students League in New York. Uh-huh. And you, you're the perfect pe- person to ask this question, uh, being an artist. Now, my, like I said, my brother graduated from the Art Students League. Another friend of mine teaches art in elementary school, and uh, I'm certainly a lay person when it comes to art. When I look at a painting... I just say, wow, that's great. But my brother and my, my buddy Lloyd, they really dissect it. And they say, yeah, but you're missing this, you're missing this. As an artist, when you look at a, at a painting or, or any piece of art, do you find yourself doing that? Do you really dissect? Or can you just say, wow, I feel good looking at this? Yeah, I mean, you can look at a, a painting, obviously, superficially and, you know, just enjoy it just for its colors or motion or you know whatever you think you're personally getting out of it but I mean obviously when a painter paints something there's an intention there I think you know and whether it's obvious or whether it's hidden uh, mm-hmm. you know it, it, it's there something inspires it whether it came from a dream or you know whether you took a picture and say okay I'm going to paint this picture because it's just you know I was there at the right moment I captured the lighting perfectly and now I want to turn that into a painting um, you know, if you go to the New York Museum uh, mo- of either Modern Art or the New York uh, Museum of, uh, what is it, the Historical Museum, I guess, in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're amazing when you look at old master's paintings. I mean, mm-hmm. because they were doing things and with light and color that, you know, it's just, it, I look at that and I'm blown away by that. Yeah. Their understanding of how light would come into play and the composition of, uh, you know, whatever they're painting, whether it's people, where, where are they positioned in the painting? And there's always a symmetry or an asymmetry there that mm-hmm. they intended. So, yeah, I mean, art is is pretty subjective thing. But, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it could be politically motivated, socially motivated. There's so many variables there as to what it actually means. It's, it's like literature. You know, you can read a story, and I remember I was a literature major in college, and I'd read it, and you know, and I thought I got it. But then, when you hear the professor talk about <laughs> what fired the writing and what's really behind it, and reading between the lines, you know, that's the trick to life: is reading. That, 
Right. That's, that is so true. I'm going to mention some names to our audience. Michael Jackson, Michael Crawford, Tom Hanks, Forrest Whitaker, Hugh Hefner, and the list goes on and on. These are all people that have purchased Stanley Livingston art. And, and everyone, check out StanleyLivingstonArt.com and Stanley's main website, StanleyLivingston.com. Um, I, one of your one of your uh, works, Stan, Waiting for Winter. They're all so nice, but my gosh, if, I don't know if you remember that one, but it's the it's called Waiting for Winter, and it's it's the tree without the leaves, and it's so intricate with the branches and the twigs. I mean, that is a beautiful, beautiful piece of art. Yeah, you know, it really is what it reminded me of. I don't know if you've ever seen coral uh, before, but they have things called coral fans, and the tree mm-hmm. reminded me of a coral fan. Of the the branches and the twigs and everything were just so intricate. Uh, in fact, the tree that I used as the model for that painting is actually at the Biltmore House. Uh, I, I think that's North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And, uh, just happened to be there, and I was just stunned by this tree. It was just you know, amazing with no leaves. I, I've never seen it with foliage, but anyway, I right. used that as inspiration for that picture. Yeah. And, and everyone, you can, you can purchase Stanley Livingston art, like I said, on his website. And um, how long does it take you to do a, a, a painting like that, for instance, Waiting for Winter? Do you uh, that start was, it go, I'm sorry, do you start it and go back, or you, you start to You finish? know, sometimes I have to work on them over a period of time, just primarily because I'm, I'm always busy doing other things, and uh, so I may work on it and then come back to it and work on it some more and then come back to it again. So mm. it's not usually a process of sitting down and working on it uh, until completion. You know, it's, mm. it's usually, unfortunately for me, a uh, process of, okay, I've got some time now, let's work on this uh, yeah. and get it done. And then it depends on, on the painting. Some of them, you know, involve fine detail. Other paintings, you know, you're kind of working in bigger, bolder type of colors, but they're, you know, broad strokes. So mm-hmm. they, but that's what you're intending, um, you know. So it, it really depends on the on the painting. Yeah, and and for fans of um, stained glass, art glass, Stanley has the oh my gosh, so many beautiful art glass uh, projects. That's how I segued back into the arts actually later because uh, I probably didn't paint for a pretty good time, probably at least ten, maybe fifteen years, and. Uh, in the early 80s, I got interested in stained glass, and uh, I was a fan of Tiffany. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to see what I can do with stained glass and then all forms of art glass where you're actually working with color and fusing glass to glass and color to glass. It's yeah. all sorts of uh, processes involved in that, as well as cut and at glass. And, uh, yeah, I ended up being pretty successful at that. It was funny. I, I kind of did it as a lark, and then people wanted to buy them, and I really wasn't really doing it to sell. I was just <laughs> doing it to, you know, get away from stuff and have something that you had under your own control, so to right. speak. And then, uh, yeah, people found out about me. I, I live in Laurel Canyon in L.A., and uh, this was probably during the 80s. And I had, in a 10-year period, I probably sold over a 1,000 pieces of wow. um, Various, including yeah. Michael Jackson, so yeah, that was pretty. pretty yeah, it, was, it was a win-win situation. You, I mean, you did it to kind of, you know, for your, for your artist's feelings, and 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 you sold it too. I mean, it's great. It is, you know, because in life you really don't have a lot of control over your life, so to speak. But art is one of the few things where you decide what you're going to do, how much time you're going to spend on it, and you're kind of doing it initially to please yourself, and if it pleases somebody else, so much the better. And I had no idea, you know, when I first started doing it, because uh, I didn't have a commercial place to show them. I was actually showing them at my place. Uh, mm-hmm. The garage door that was up, because I was in my garage doing them, and then <laughs> the next thing I knew, somebody pulled over and said, wow, can I buy that? And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> days later, somebody else pulled in and goes, hey, where was that thing that was hanging there? I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And I go, oh, well, somebody bought that. And they said, well, could you do another one? I went, sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to let our listeners know, originally, everyone, um, because of my fault, uh, I had scheduled, we had scheduled an interview earlier uh, with, with Stan Livingston. And because of something with me, we couldn't do it. And Stan was as busy as he is. He was so nice to reschedule to today. So, Stan, I want to thank you for that as well, for really fitting us into your busy schedule. It's really appreciated. No problem at all. I, I yeah, love doing shows and meeting people and talking to people and talking yeah. to the public. And now with with my three sons, we're going to. By the way, we're going to get to the Actors Journey Project because that's such an important project. We're going to do that a little bit, but I'm going to go back and uh, even before my three sons. Um, Stan Livingston fans know, of course, that you were on another series even before my three sons. 
I was. Uh, that's actually where I started in the uh, business officially as an actor uh, was Ozzy and Harriet, the Adventures yeah. of Ozzy. I think I did my first episode for them about 19, well, I hate to say this, but about 1956. Mm -hmm. As a child actor, and actually I was a child extra when I got on the show, and uh, had no lines, but I was with a group of kids that come out of a patch of Christmas trees. Uh, Ozzy was trying to sell to make extra money during the Christmas season. And uh, for whatever reason, Ozzy pulled me aside and said, hey, I want you to say this line, and my line was sure is mighty good camping in there, Mr. Nelson. And then <laughs> anyway, I said the line satisfactorily, and I remember we did it twice, and I, I didn't realize it, but the second time I did it, it was a close-up, and the close-up was used, and he came up to my mom afterwards and said, um, you know, I'm interested in having him come back as a, a regular neighborhood kid on the show. And so uh, obviously my mom was pleased. Uh, I mm -hmm. set a line on... Film, so that now allowed me to join the Screen Actors Guild as a as a real actor. And um, anyway, it just kind of blossomed out from there. I started doing movies, other TV shows. I did Rally Around the Flag Boys with uh, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Uh, Please don't eat the daisies with Doris Day, David Niven. Um, How the West was one, I think. You, right? How yeah, the West How was the West one, which was the last uh, Cinerama film shot. Who that that included everybody who was anybody in Hollywood. It was a huge to do uh, actually it's kind of funny because when I got involved in the industry um, the reason I did it is I wanted to be in, in a cowboy I wanted to be in all <laughs> on TV and I just could not seem to nail one down in the in the 50s uh, and early 60s and finally How the West is One came along which if you're going to pick a western to be in that was probably the quintessential western uh, not only did it have everybody from you know Jimmy Stewart John Wayne Henry Fonda Debbie Reynolds, I mean, literally anybody who was anybody in Hollywood at that time was in that movie, but the movie was actually shot in this unique cinematic process called Cinerama, which involves projecting it on a, a huge curved screen that actually wraps around the actors, so you almost have uh, about a 170 degree, I think it's about a 170 degree view of it wrapping around you. So it's very immersive, uh, especially when the camera moves, you feel like you're in a, a car moving down the street while you're watching the film. Is it kind of a precursor to IMAX, or IMAX isn't even close to it? Um, it? It's a different process. Actually, Cinerama saved the movie industry. A lot of people don't know that. In 1953, uh, yeah, people just, you know, they're so used to widescreen now that they don't realize that there was another format that since the beginning of time all films were shot in, which is almost like a square format. It's just mm -hmm. a little yep. bit more than a square, and that's what was always projected on TV and was projected in theaters. In about 1953, TV was coming in, and people were defecting from the movie theaters to stay home and, and watch TV. Mm -hmm. And they had to think of something quick, and there was this process that some inventors came up with called uh, Cinerama, which involved shooting a film with three cameras, one pointing straight ahead, one pointing to the left, one pointing to the right. And so it gave you this super panoramic view. And then when you projected it, it involved projecting three strips of film that were aligned so that it made a continuous picture on a curved screen. Mm -hmm. um, it was such a big deal in 1953. They made a movie called This Is Cinerama. That uh, when they showed it, it, it was it, well, it was the highest grossing film, I believe, of 1953. But it was also an event. People were going to it wearing suits and tuxedos, mm -hmm. and yeah. it was just unbelievable. Um, I just saw it recently, and I'm I'm like I'm sure in 1953 it was amazing because people are used to watching right. these all films, and here's this thing that's probably four times as wide so it just blew people's minds but it's it's actually not a very good film in terms it it has no story no structure it was basically kind of a proof proof of concept film and they took yeah. it and they mounted it on roller coasters and on ships so you really got the sensation of, of movement yeah. and motion but there wasn't any story behind it that kind of happened they did about two or three of those and then finally some hollywood filmmakers got a hold of the process and they they started utilizing they did the wonderful world of brothers Grimm and mm -hmm. how the west was won and it also s continued actually um 2001 is a cinerama film but by that point they had figured out a way to project it onto this super wide screen but it was actually one piece of film mm -hmm. it's uh i guess what they call like a super this division, and then it's also anamorphic. It was squeezed onto a piece of film, and they shoot oh. it, and then unsqueezed when you 
uh, when you finally project it. But it gave you the same image as you would have with regular Cinerama. Mad, 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 mad world was also, uh, it's also a Cinerama film. Yeah, what a movie. <laughs> yeah, the difference is when you see IMAX, it's a huge screen, but it's still a flat screen. You're yeah, it's just at, a big, big screen, yeah. Just a big screen, right, where this one actually wraps around you. That's what makes it so immersive. Mm. What do you prefer, Stan, uh, TV or movie acting, or is there much of a difference? Um, well, there is. I mean, you know, it depends the era you came out of, too. But, you know, I, I think in terms of acting style, there, there's, you know, TV has kind of, I think, become more like movie acting, uh, that the actors who do it do less and less, which is sort of required if you're in a big film. I mean, you don't want to go up and be large on a big screen. It's, <laughs> uh, it's very, you look like a ham bone. So you basically <laughs> have to... You know, you have to become the character, and it's all internalized, and, you know, you see what's going on through the actor's eyes, and very mm -hmm. little emotion where TV, a little bit more, you know, and in, in the era that I came out, I, you know, I think people came a lot from stage, so to me, a lot of it looks like they're acting, where yeah. today's actors, you know, what they're taught is acting is not acting, but being. So, yeah, oh my gosh. I, you know, I I, I'm, big, not a, I'm not a fan of reality TV. I don't know about yourself, but uh, TV is... I, I know I'm sounding like an old old fart here, but TV is just not the way it used to be, boy. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's room for everything. I mean, I, I understand TV, I mean, from the producer's point of view, they did that where, you know, they invented it. They were having trouble with the Guild, and the Guild didn't want to acquiesce to certain terms they wanted for actors, and they thought, well, what are we going to do? we got all this space to fill, and somebody <laughs> said, hey, mm -hmm. let's just shoot some people and see how that goes, yeah. and not... Um, and it, you know everybody thought it would be a flash in the pan, like like rap music. Mm -hmm. And uh, guess what? Both are still around. So 30, 30 40 years market. later, yeah. Yeah, and an audience. You know, yep. I mean, some of it I've seen that I, I think is really good. Uh, I think Undercover Boss is totally an amazing show. Oh yeah, of course. It, yeah, I, you know what? I shouldn't put it, have put it under an, an umbrella like that. Reality TV. I'm, yeah, just generally speaking, but. I don't know about Honey Boo Boo, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, well, Honey Boo Boo, it's fascinating to see people leading different lives other than mm -hmm. your own. Yeah, uh, but um, you know, before yeah, we move on, yeah, something for say, everybody. Yeah, before we move on to my three sons, I just have one more, two more questions about the Nelsons. Were they were, were they as nice as they appeared on screen? The Nelson family. They were absolutely the nicest people I think I've ever met, or, or mm -hmm. worked in show business, uh, and very good, Ozzy in particular, working with children. You know, by the point I came on the show, uh, Dave and Ricky were about 16 and 18, so, you know, for all intents and purposes, they were adult, and somehow, either innately, or maybe somebody put a bug in his ears, and need to, you need to have kids on the show. If you want, you know, kids to watch your show, you need to have kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to have your own kind up there to watch. So he kept the show populated with little neighborhood kids, and, you know, I happened to be one of them, and they would write stories around. And one, they had a pony, and I remember I somehow took to the pony, and I kept sleeping in the garage, and somebody thinks I ran away, but, you know, <laughs> the story revolved around me. Another one, when there was the 1950, it's about 1958, the flying saucer craze that went on, they had a flying saucer show. <laughs> Yeah. Remember being in that one, and at the end, I'm I'm kind of in a spaceman outfit, and I run into what turns out to be an alien, um, <laughs> and the show kind of ends on that. So, you know, he he was smart in in that effect. Uh, yeah, I was good at you know with kids. My brother actually worked on my three cents. We, the very last show I did for him, uh, my brother was also in the episode, and you know they knew he was just starting to act by then. And the, the big motivator for Ozzy to get kids to do what he wanted, it, it wasn't meth acting, it wasn't Stanislavski, it was a bowl of ice cream. That <laughs> was the reward if you did a good job. So, still works today, still works today. I'm sure. that's, uh, it's amazing what you can get out of somebody with a bowl of ice cream, but we were all method ice cream actors. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was, was Rick Nelson, um, had he started singing his, uh, his singing career at that time? About the time I was on the show was when he was just getting going. I remember he was always sitting around on the set with a guitar, and I remember he let me, like, try and play his guitar and was showing me some chords and all that. And uh, he had that song come up, Poor Little Fool. Oh, yeah. And uh, this was pretty ingenious, too. Ozzy got the idea of, at the end of the show, taking Ricky's song and combining it into the show. There would be a thing where it was supposed to be, I guess, a high school dance or maybe he was even in college then I can't can't remember quite how old he was but uh, then they would get all these young girls to come and they'd stand there in front of the stage and they would film it and that's how the show would go out but 
when you think about TV in those days, that's what's different than now. You know, if you have a network show on, you probably have 20 million people maybe watching you, you know, 16 to 20 mm -hmm. million. In those days, you probably had 50, 60 million people because there was only three networks. And if you were a hit right. show, you had most of the people watching your show, so you could have 50 to 60 million people a week watching, or in this case, watching Ricky sing the song that you were immediately going to go out if you were a 15-year-old yeah. girl and go buy a record. Yeah, he was cleverized. He really was. Uh, he had, uh, you know, boy. I, I loved Rick Nelson. Did you? Did yeah, you, me too. I mean, yeah. you know, I I thought he was right up there with Elvis. And if you me look too. at the body of his work, it's pretty complete. And boy, if there was a guy who could sort of rival him for good looks, it certainly was Rick. Yeah, I agree. I so agree. Well, now to my three sons. Actually, um, Stan, you were in. You had some run with two. Uh, I think two of the longest running sitcoms in TV history. My yeah. three sons. I know you weren't in Auntie Harriet for the whole run, of course, but you were a part of, boy, all 12 years of My Three Sons, 380 episodes, I believe. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, when did that start? 60, 61, 62? You know, My looking three back, sons? it sounds like it's, it's awesome, <laughs> but at the time, each year, we never knew we were coming back, uh, literally two weeks before the show. So you were always kind of on pins and needles at the end of a season going, well, maybe I won't see these people anymore, and... It was really great working with them, and, and then you know, suddenly, maybe around April or whatever, you get a telegram from the head of CBS saying, welcome back, and we're doing another you know, season uh -huh, of my... Yeah. yeah, in the <laughs> beginning, we shot quite a few shows. It's not done quite that way anymore. You're lucky if you get eight episodes now. It used to be 13. Yeah. When we finished My Three Sons, I think we were shooting about 24 episodes a year, but in the beginning of My Three Sons in 1960, we were shooting 39 episodes a year. That was kind of the norm. Yeah. So they showed 39, and then you would take 13 of those, only 13 of the 39, and repeat them. So a lot of them were never seen a second time ever until you know, the Nickelodeon era in 85. Yeah, and I, I, I watch on MeTV now as well. Yeah. Times. Yeah. Was, was the fact that uh, you really didn't know from season to season, was that based on Fred McMurray's schedule or just ratings or you just... Always just, ratings, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> well, let me rephrase it. It's usually ratings. In the case of Fred McMurray, because he was on the show, this, My Three Sons was actually created for him by a producer named Don Pedersen. Mm -hmm. And this may not resonate you know, with your younger listeners. They probably are going, well, who, who's Fred McMurray outside of My Three Sons? But mm -hmm. in perspective, when, my, when Fred McMurray agreed to do My Three Sons in 1960 on TV, it was unheard of that a movie star of his caliber was actually going to do the daily grind of, of a TV show. Mm -hmm. It was a mega, mega, mega movie star. Uh, it would be huge, like Brad yeah. Pitt or Tom Cruise saying, hey, I'm going to do a TV series now. It, it mm -hmm. just was unheard of. So the network was falling all over themselves and did everything they could to cater to Mr. McMurray. And I mean, our show was handled with kit gloves the entire time it was on. And the reality is, I don't think anybody, including William S. Paley, who owned CBS, wanted to be the guy to tell Fred McMurray your show is canceled. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, our show really was never canceled due to bad ratings. <laughs> What happened was at the end of 72, uh, the FCC passed legislation where networks, at that point in time, they made our show. It was originally made by Don Federson and Fred McMurray, owned the production company, and it was licensed to CBS. CBS bought the show kind of midway through it, about 1967. So they were the, you know, the, ostensibly the producer of the show and the exhibitor. Well, it violated antitrust laws, and they had to divest of any shows that they were producing. They were allowed to keep one show uh, that they owned and operated, and they chose to keep uh, Gunsmoke. So at that point in time, we were just kind of quietly euthanized, but we were still in, had respectable ratings for Absolutely. a 12-year-old show. You know, we were mm -hmm. always in the... I would say maybe maybe not in the top 10, but between 10 and 20, 30. You've got to be down in the 80, 80s or 100s to get canceled. Mm -hmm. No, we I never mean, really digress. Wow. You guys were always a hit. I, I remember. I, you know, it, it, I just want to tell you a quick personal thing. I remember, well, we had black and white TV. Even when you guys went to color, we yep. still had black and white TV. But my uncle Bob, <laughs> he had a color TV. And the very first show I saw as a color TV show was My Three Sons. We walked into his house. Your show was on. I said, well, that's what they look like in color. And it was amazing. You know, you take it for granted now, of course. But My I Three know, Sons I know. Well, you, me, you did and me, my parents, we never had a color TV till I think my three sons was over for about five years before my parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, could, could we talk about the Fred McMurray method? He, um, it was kind of unorthodox that he was only there for a certain filming period of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's how they talked him into doing the show. He, he at first was balking because he said, look, I don't want to be here, you know, 52 weeks a year doing this. Uh, and the reason for it was he and his wife, June Haber, had, had just adopted two small girls and, you know, they were growing up and he really didn't want to do movies and spend, you know, six months, nine months out of Hollywood and you come back and your kids are all grown up. So it kind of, you know, there was a little bit of inspiration then there for him to be in Hollywood and maybe to do a show. And they came up with this idea of um, what if we shot all your parts kind of together, do a, a bulk of shooting and you would have to be there every day uh, from eight to six for about three months. Then you can go away for the summer for three months and then come back at the end for another, you know, three month period and we'll finish up the rest of the episodes and shoot the scenes you weren't in. So mm. that's what he agreed to do. So that became known as the McMurray method. Uh, for us, what it meant was in that first three month stretch, you know, we, they, Fred McMurray worked very hard. He was in every single shot, uh, from eight in the morning till six p.m. at night. But how they would do it is they would shoot the master and then they would shoot his close up. And then we would move on to the next scene, leaving everybody else's close-up to be shot at a later point in time. So it was kind of hellish, I guess, for the continuity person to make sure we had the right clothes on, our hair was sort mm. of combed the same way, and, you know, uh, particularly... How was that, how was that night, for you as an actor? Was it tough? had a growing spurt. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, especially... Wait a minute, it wasn't just three inches shorter <laughs> in the beginning of the scene, and now he's about three inches taller. He's got some acne coming out. No. <laughs> yeah, acne. Right, there, was, there was a pimple there, and then miraculous between the master and your close-up, it, it vanished. <laughs> How is that for you as an actor? Uh, you know, having to work that way and, and like out of. You know what? Of... It, it sounds abnormal, but it, uh, you know, even features are shot that way. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you try and shoot as much as you can in order. But having done you know a lot of feature films by then, that you're always shooting out of continuity. Uh, it's not usually to that extreme where you come back so much later to pick things up. Um, you know, you may come back a day or two later and pick it up, or at the end of the day after the person like uh, Fred McMurray, who worked from eight to six, they leave you, they shoot him, they shoot his close up, leave your close up out. And if had I been 18 years old, I would have been there to probably eight or nine o'clock at night because that's what they did with the sometimes with the other guys who were, mm. you know, 18 years or better. Uh, they would have to hang around, work to whatever eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. Yeah, what? yeah. Um, the series is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I I had read um, even back in the days of I Love Lucy, so I'm not not saying anything that hasn't been uh, written but William Frawley was read the right act by Desi Arnaz he, he, he was known to be a drinker William Frawley uh, even during the I Love Lucy days how, how, did, how was he on uh, My Three Sons if, if you yeah, don't mind you talking know, about I, it I curtailed it a little bit probably to get the job but I, I can verify as a fact because I ate lunch with Bill Frawley almost every single day when he was on the show at, at noon we would go to a a restaurant that was right behind the soundstage where we were called Nicodell's, which was a famous Hollywood watering hole, and uh, have lunch with him. And Bill pretty much had a liquid lunch. <laughs> uh, you ate and he drank. <laughs> so, yeah, he would get a little bit toasted at lunch, and you know, I always joke around and say that was kind of my little side job was, you know, I, the uh, producers or associate producers would come over and say, you got to get Bill up. He won't listen to anybody but you. You know, if you get him moving towards the sound stage about quarter of one, he'll he'll be there about one o'clock. So, you know, and Bill was just the sort of guy who was irascible and, and I don't want to say he was foul mouth, but he could use some pretty good four letter yeah. words. And, you know, if it was an adult asking that, he'd go tell him to F themselves. And, uh, <laughs> so you and got along with So you got okay, along Okay, kid. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. then he'd get up. But he, yeah, so. Bill was sort of, I hate to say it, but he was like the grandfather I never had. You know, he was sort of one of those Debussy Field type actors who, uh, I don't think he really cuddled up to kids or animals, but for some reason when the show started, uh, we took a shine to each other and, uh, you know, we hung out, played checkers, played chess, played cards. Wow, so they had a nice relationship with him. Yeah, I had a great relationship with him, you know, and yeah, he, he really, I think, loved me. In fact, it's funny, for my uh, third, I think it was the 14th birthday, he bought a Dewey Weber surfboard for me. He knew I was into surfing then. Wow. And, you know, for a guy in his, what, mid-70s, 
you know, you think he'd stick a $20 bill in an envelope and be done with it. And somehow he was listening to me and knew what I liked. And, really you know, for a guy that didn't even drive to go out and get a nine foot long Dewey Weber surfboard and put it in my dressing room, uh, yeah, I don't very think he went out and paid for it. <laughs> I, I was blown away, you know, yeah. be blown away, you know. So we, you know, Stan, Stan, I love, uh, I mean, your character of Chip Douglas is just so great. And you were, um, what I, there are so many things about your character, but I loved your kind of um, subtle, wise guy attitude at sometimes. Like you would say something and a scene would end and Fred McMurray would just be standing there bemused and his eyebrows would go up and you'd either walk off to the kitchen or walk upstairs. I mean, that was you, you played Chip Douglas so great. Oh, was, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I <laughs> appreciate that. Yeah, you know, it was, it was a good show. And I mean, that was sort of the theme of the show. It's not, you know, kids that are doing bad things they're doing questionable things but the whole thrust of the show was is that you were raised right and without his interference you would come to the right decision on your own right. and, and do you well with kids yeah and then they would cut to fred mcmurray smiling because he knew he <laughs> raised you right right yeah now how about um to the police station and picking you up <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah that's what it would be today <laughs> yeah yeah, it is. It really is. You know, I was yeah. saying, you know, not that I didn't get into mischief off stage myself, but you know, in those days, it was a completely different thing. Where if you did something you weren't supposed to do, and the police kind of showed up or were watching you do something stupid. Yeah. Now, now you'd be like handcuffed, arrested. You'd have a record. In those days, it's just like, you know, we're going to be watching you, and don't ever do that again. And you know, yep. and you'd let be, you go. You'd be, on, but you'd be on TMZ, and <laughs> you'd be on TMZ. They'd have your mug shot. You know, your eleven-year-old <laughs> mug shot up there, and <laughs> just it's a completely different world. Well, I mean, if you really want to get down to it, you couldn't do a show like Ozzy and Harriet anymore. No, and a guy, you know, who. Nobody really knows what Ozzy did for a living. Uh, you know, hanging out with uh, eight, nine-year-old kids or boys in a malt shop. Yeah. You know, I mean, in 1950s, that was totally innocent, and he was just being a nice guy. And in this day and age, there would be something right into that yeah. that would not be uh, not be right. That scene would be right out. Yeah. But, you know, you know, Stan, I mean, I'll be 61 my next birthday, and... I sit and watch, like I said, my three sons on MeTV and other shows of that sort, and it's 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 such like a calming, peaceful feeling. It's like old old friends are visiting me. I know it sounds maybe a little corny to say that, but the show really, really, I mean, meant so much to so many people in, in our generation. I know we're we're about you know in the same age age uh, bracket, but. You know, do you? I'm sure you hear all the time from people. You know, thanks, Stan. What a great show! It was a big part of my growing up. Do you hear that all the time? Yeah, I do. You know, and I mean the fact that I think that it was on for so long initially. You know, it ran 12 years, uh, and then it immediately went into syndication in '72, and ran every single day after that from '72 to '85, and then in '85. Uh, Nick at Night was created, and they took all those old black and white episodes that were never seen again and started showing those, for, and they did that for 10 years, and then TV Land came along, and they took those same shows, started showing them daily during the daytime for about 10 years. So mm -hmm. people feel like, you know, my three cents has been coming to your house, almost like a relative, you know, or a, oh, right. a friend or a neighbor or somebody you really, really got to know. I have so many guys and, you know, females come up to me and say, you know, I felt like you were a family member or you were living in the house next door or I wanted to be in your family, not mine. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's complimentary and, and you know, I, I totally get it. Uh, the part that I didn't get at first is I really, because I grew up in L.A. and particularly Hollywood, it's a pretty jaded town. So unless you're, I don't know, Brad Pitt walking down the street, you know, it's not going to attract much attention. And even probably Brad Pitt, people out here are too cool to even say anything. And it wasn't until the maybe mid-'80s, my brother and I did some plays out of town. In fact, we were in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. There were some friends of ours on uh, a couple of dinner theaters there that we did some stuff. And I couldn't believe it. You know, the people that would come to the show, you know, we were in a theater where it was, I don't know, it was probably 500 people a night would come see these plays we were in, and we were there for maybe three, four months doing them in a pop. And, uh, you know, you, you really, I just never saw people react like that, where they're falling all over themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It carpet. I'm like, what is this? You know, I mean, at first it was very awkward for me because I'd never seen people do that and then you know i think it was around that period of time that i realized how much the show meant to people that you know being the actor i didn't i didn't get it i wasn't the audience so but i started to understand that that show really had left an indelible 
imprint on people as to either the quality or type of life that they aspire to. And it certainly was a clean show that, mm -hmm. you know, until you have your own kids and have to make a decision about what they're watching, you know, sometimes you're looking for shows like that that yeah. you really can let your kid watch and, and feel sort of safe about. Not that it was totally purient, but, um, yeah. but you know, it certainly was a good show for, for kids. And, and the good thing was there was somebody there for everybody, especially in the beginning. You know, I'm a little nine-year-old kid. Uh, Don Grady was, whatever, 15, 16, and the older brother before Barry came on. Tim Consign was about 19, 20. Then you had the bachelor dad who was probably about 45, and then you had the grandpa. So mm -hmm. oh, it's the right. whole, that, that was the novelty of the show is this all well, male household uh, yeah. covering every particular generation. So I'm sure Bill probably got a lot of love letters from grandmas and <laughs> right. already a, a hot movie star. <laughs> so, uh, Stan, I'm sure you got a lot of great guys Stan. and, you know, sort of a cute kid. So. You must have gotten your share, more than your share of. Uh, marriage proposals uh well <laughs> used to get a lot of fan mail and yeah i mean you know that that's a nice thing about being an actor uh the tough part for me was uh i knew a lot of kids that were in the business in those days that were my peers or contemporaries uh and most of them you know when their show would finish shooting they would go back to a school called hollywood professional school which was in hollywood and kind of catered to show business kids and you'd go there three hours a day nine to twelve and that get your education done that way and it kind of freed you up if you had an audition in the afternoon you could go to it as, a, as opposed to public school where you went eight uh, whatever three o'clock mm -hmm. or they would have tutors that were hired privately you know by their parents to educate them and mm -hmm. in my case that <laughs> that was not the case my parents had decided we were going back to public school in between uh seasons and every year for 12 years um how was that stan uh, frightening at first because, you know, went from, I, I'd already, you know, kids, I, I grew up in Hollywood, so I went to Bond Street Elementary School, so the, the kids there kind of got used to seeing me on TV, but there was a sort of surreal quality about it where, here's a guy that's on TV, but wait a minute, he's in the school, why him, you know? <laughs> it was very confusing, but then when my three sons hit, I guess I, I must have been, I don't know, maybe the fourth, fifth grade or something. And, uh, you know, it, it was immediately a super, I mean, it was like almost the biggest show on TV. So um, it was kind of weird going back, you know. I'd have to swallow before I went back to the school, not because I didn't like going to school, but I knew I was going to have to face all these kids who, you know, some of them like me or my friends ignore me, but then suddenly it turned into, you know, like a mob scene when you would get there the first day and, you know, these girls attacking you and yeah, uh -huh. wanting and, and to be your friend or the other side of the guy is wanting to beat you up. So, yeah, um, she was jealous. You know, kind of both ways. So I had to learn how to, uh, you know, deal with both. Mm. Defend my honor, defend the honor of my duties. <laughs> so I was in quite a few little, you know, altercations, I guess you could say. Now, uh, yeah, I got you, through it. But, you yeah. know, I think my parents ultimately made the right choice because, you know, if you're a show business kid, that only lasts so long, and you, you you live in the real world, and this was the real world, and you got to learn how to deal with real people. And you know, my brother and I, I think we both skillfully learned how to handle those situations and defuse them, and talk to kids, and you know, yeah. I don't think we ever, and, and it kept you from really getting a big head and feeling special. You know, that that's the main thing where you can be full of yourself if you're a a big TV star or a movie star, and I think this kept us very level-headed. We mm. just kind of always looked at it as just work that we did. It was almost like going to a factory, really, and mm. uh, whatever the glamour and glitz was, I I'm still looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, I mean, like I mentioned before, I, Stan, I, I'm sure you, you'll, you'll never know just how many of us love you and, and my three sons. I mean, uh, I'm sure you feel it, but there's so many still millions and millions of fans who grew up with it who, who you know just adored the show and you too um now the original three sons tim considine don grady and yourself uh after tim considine left then of course your brother barry came in yeah what was what, what's it like working with your brother um well like i said we had worked on we did an ozzy and harry right together. yeah and Even we then. actually did a movie together. Barry is actually in Rally Round the Flag Boys uh, with Paul Newman and Joan Woodward. However, uh, by noon the first day, he got fired. <laughs> so, what happened? 
<coughs> well, it was probably one of the most fortuitous firings ever. Um, we were supposed to be watching a TV set, and Joanne Woodward's in the kitchen, kitchen making dinner, and Paul Newman walks in, and you know he's trying to get our attention and chat with us, and we just completely ignore him and are watching the TV set. And that was our our goal as actors was to ignore him, and no matter what he did, not laugh, not do anything. Well, unfortunately, my brother. The director said, cut, and goes, you're not looking at the TV set, Barry. I need it to be looking right at the TV set. And Barry's like, well, I am. You know, he goes, no, you're not. <laughs> so <laughs> it went on and on. We did about, I don't know, about 10 takes. Finally, the director was really frustrated. They sent Barry to an optometrist during the uh, lunch hour. It turned out they discovered my brother had a cross eye. So it was wow. never going to look what? like he was looking at the TV set to the camera's point of view, where out of Barry's crooked eye he was. And anyway, Barry was fired, and by two o'clock we were shooting the scene with another kid actor, and uh, uh, that got Barry glasses, which completely changed his career. Fortuitous, and is so had he right, not done huh? that, he wouldn't have been, you know, the, the quintessential nerd, I guess. Mm, well, uh, um, but funny, there is a scene of Barry in Rally Around the Flag. There's a scene earlier in the film where he ate some pennies or something, and Joanne Woodward and the plumber have him by his ankles, and he's upside down. <laughs> him, and if you look very carefully, you can see it's Barry. It's not the other kid. <laughs> now, um, a very important uh, project. You're the founder and CEO of Actors Journey Project. Uh, can we talk about that, please? Let us let our audience know. By the way, everyone, it's the Actors Journey Project. dot com. Um, Actors Journey dot com. Actors Actually, Journey. you can go to both. Come yeah. to think of I think on your website is uh, uh, stanleylivingston dot com. I think you have. Um, yeah, there's links a link there. That. Yeah. yeah Tell we, us, Tell us about the reason that. we had the Actors Journey Project dot com. There's actually two projects. There's the Actors Journey, and then there's the Actors Journey for Kids, which is for parents, and they both have their own website. So we just figured if you go to the Actors Journey Project dot com, there's two links there. In fact, I think that's all that's there. So you, mm-hmm. if you're a, an adult actor, you can go to the Actors Journey, and if you're a parent interested in involving your children in the industry, you can go to the Actors Journey for Kids dot com. And can you, can you tell us what it's all about? In a nutshell. Um, well, as most people know, uh, this especially holds true for adult actors, is they spend a lot of time and a lot of money uh, developing themselves as actors. They usually go off to two or four year schools, colleges, universities, and you know, you're going to spend two to four years in the classroom learning the art and craft of acting. You're probably going to drop anywhere from 10000 to $60,000 learning this aspect of uh, of acting which you have to have it's it's basically the bottom line you got to learn how to become a professional level actor so and that's usually where it ended for most actors and you know they graduate and come out to hollywood and, and get here and go uh all right i know how to act uh, i have no idea how to break into the industry i know nothing about the industry how it works what i'm supposed to be doing and over the years you know we just saw this where you have tens of not hundreds of thousands of people graduating from these schools spending a lot of money and a lot of them are really great actors and not being able to find the way into the industry because what's not taught at the university and college level is the business part of this mm-hmm. or what we call business and career development aspect of your career which is a completely different thing than acting acting does not get you into the movie or television industry it's what you do once you arrive you get to act but there's a completely different component and set of skills needed to break into the industry, and that involves the, the business side of being an actor. And that's what you do probably 95% of the time. You know, what you find out when you're an actor, if you're a professional actor, as I've been for, I guess, I don't know, 60 years, is that if you threaded up everything that I ever did on a projector, every movie, every TV show, every episode of My Three Sons and ran it, you know, it might run six months. So that mm-hmm. those wow. they're... 59 years and six months of my career, I was out there looking for work. And that's really what we do. Uh, that's why I always tell actors, look, when you get a job and you're acting, whether it's you know on a stage or in front of a camera, that's not work. That's your reward for what you did for that job. That's your work. Mm-hmm. That's what you find out. And unfortunately, there's, no, there's never been a clear, concise program to teach actors about this business side. So... Uh, about 10 years ago, I got the idea to put a program together uh, because, like I said, the colleges don't teach it, the acting schools don't teach it. You can learn a little bit about it on the Internet, but you know, not really in-depth, and that's unfortunately what you need. It's an in-depth program, just mm-hmm. like what you had with your actors. So we created a program called the Actors' Journey Program, 
and I brought a hundred people from our industry together. They were all people who were sort of handpicked by me that I'd either worked with or worked for or were peers of mine, and we brought them together to teach this 10-hour long program called The Actor's Journey, which is a program on the business side of being an actor. So it literally cuts through, you know, uh, and makes crystal clear what you should be doing and how to go about doing it. And we thought we would use these people as the models to do it because everybody that we brought into the picture, into the Actor's Journey Project to teach it, had worked in the industry 20, 30 years. Uh, 40 of these people have either been nominated, been nominated for or won Golden Globe, Academy Award, uh, Emmy Awards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're really uh, very high caliber people. They've been there, they've done it, they've succeeded. And basically taking what they've learned out of doing it for 20 or 30 years and basically just handing it over to new actors. There, there's been no provision or no system of transmitting this information to the, you know, to the newer people that are coming into the industry, which is right. ridiculous, because mm -hmm. it makes actors have to go out there and learn it for themselves. In other words, it's ridiculous. Each person has to keep reinventing the same wheel, and that was what struck me. I'm like, well, wait a minute. There's all these people that know this. Of course, these people don't teach because they have careers, but what mm -hmm. if we get them to teach this program? on a DVD, which then would be portable, so no matter where you live, because actors come from everywhere, they have access to this business program so they can go about their careers. I mean, this hard enough business to do when you know what you're doing. And if you don't right. know what you're doing, it's, it's, I mean, the statistics speak for themselves. We're talking about well, probably about 100,000 people a year coming to the industry and knocking on the door of Hollywood and trying to make their way into it. And without this information, 99 point nine percent of them go away they eventually just get frustrated and give up and you know walk away from a potential career or they find themselves into what we call the minor league you know there are a bunch of low budget non-union um low paying no paying acting jobs especially with the proliferation of cheap equipment digital equipment yeah. you know everybody thinks they're a filmmaker and yeah and i'm not saying not to do that that is a way to get stuff on a reel so you can show the other side of what you've learned, which is the acting. But you need to have a, a systematic way of getting yourself into the mainstream of the industry, uh, where that's where the paychecks are. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately mm -hmm. in the farm league there are either no paychecks or if they are, you know, you're making fifty or a hundred bucks a day doing this kind of work. So unless you're content with staying at that level and never having your career rise above that, or if you're interested in community theater because you just want the sheer intrinsic exhilaration of acting, uh, you probably don't need the program. But if you're trying to find your way into the mainstream of the acting, meaning broadcast TV, broadcast cable, uh, theatrical motion pictures, cable motion pictures, you need the program. Otherwise, you're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. When actors first come to the industry, they don't know anybody. You know, they're brand new, and you're not a commodity, so nobody knows you, nobody really wants mm -hmm. to help you, and you really do feel the cold shoulder of Hollywood. So... You and need some kind of edge or need to yeah. meet somebody who's going to teach you the ropes. And that's kind of what this program does. Yeah, anyway, then, we created a 10-hour program, as I mentioned, it's taught by 100 people, not just actors. There's directors, producers, executive producers, showrunners, uh, casting directors, talent agents, talent managers. Uh, two of the people were the presidents of the two key unions. Uh, one was the president of sag after the other was the president of the Directors Guild of America, and then there's about 10 people that sat on the various boards at, at these various unions, too. So you're literally getting the information from the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. And, and with, uh, I, I'm sure with so many new actors, they come in with this feeling of idealism rather than the realism of the business, and, and you kind of set them straight with this. They do, and, and I mean, you know, unfortunately what happens, and you know, I'm not saying that the universities do this on purpose, but they don't want you to know about this other component until you finish your spending your $60,000 at their yeah. university. Yeah. Then they go, oh, by the way, there's this other thing called the business of acting, but you'll just pick that up. Well, mm -hmm. the statistics show that actors don't pick it up because there's the only way you can learn it is go out there and try and do it, but the experiences come. They're so few and far between uh, for you to collect all these little pieces of the puzzle. You're worn out, and you still don't have a comprehensive overview of what the industry is, mm. how it works in regards to procuring talent, you know, especially for the mainstream stuff. Uh, that, you know, you feel really frustrated, and there's nowhere to turn to. Um, or there are a lot of people out there uh, that are self-appointed experts that although they haven't made it in the industry, they're going to teach you how. And they pretty <laughs> much 
the cursory thing. I mean, what most actors, and I think the ones that are coming out of college, think the business of acting is is get a headshot, get a reel together, get a resume, get a talent agent, and get into Screen Actors Guild, and you know, you wipe your hands off and you're done. You've done the business part. Oh, yeah. Well, that's five of the things. How come we have 55 more? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. I have topics that you need to know about in depth to do this kind of work, and the only ones that are ever mentioned are those five, six things uh, that you know most actors, and that's kind of the obvious. That's why that's taught. And even those I don't think are really taught correctly, and I've watched uh, people teach this before, and uh, you need information about that too. And the good part about this program is when you hear somebody who's worked in the industry talking about, you know, even your headshots, you know, that sounds like it's a simple thing to do, but most people, yeah. most new actors don't know how to select a photographer or what a good photograph really is. Mm. They're relying on another person who's usually another actor at their same rung on the ladder for advice. And, you know, it may or may not hold true, but when you've heard mm. somebody, you know, talk about this and illustrate what you need to do if, you're, if you do need headshots about getting them and how you meet with a photographer and what you should be asking them and, and to actually have some ideas in your head of what a good photograph looks like. Because, you know, if you're, you're in a different part of a country uh, and a photograph that, or a headshot that necessarily works in L.A. may not work in New York or may not work in the South. You know, it, it is regional. So. so so many of these things that I think the lay person has no idea about. No, no. I mean, we see people get out of school, and, you know, unfortunately, this is the other side of it, is they get out of school, and if you've just dropped $60,000, you know, you're thinking, hey, I just completed my education. Mm-hmm. They just taught me everything. What more is there to know? You can't believe that you have been incompletely <laughs> educated. Oh, so they stop, they're they really shocked to find out there's this other thing that they're going to have to try and learn very quickly. And because there's been nowhere to resource as a resource for this information, it gets really frustrating. Like I said, the only thing you're going to find out are those five or six things. And most people end up with the wrong kind of pictures the first time. They just spend five or six hundred dollars only to find out that the pictures they have are non-compliant or that the agents don't like them. Um, you oh, know, boy. What a, yeah, it's what a really nightmare. Hard. Or the other one is they come out and they get lucky really quick and maybe on their first acting job it's a speaking part and it's a SAG film and they get tapped partly which means they can now join the union and guess what they do mm. which is the very worst thing you can do you, it sounds logical that if you had the opportunity to join the union that you should but if you're a new actor you definitely shouldn't why because the, the part that you just had maybe holding the door open for Brad Pitt and going uh, this way sir well that line is not going to get you any more work <laughs> yeah, anybody could do that, right? Yeah, sure. So when you work in that type of film, it makes you eligible to join the union, but you shouldn't yet. You can just mm -hmm. put the piece of paper they gave you in your back pocket. What you need to do is go out there and do a bunch of non-union and, and the, the films that I mentioned that are at the farm league level. Because what you want to do is amass some footage on yourself where maybe you're the lead or the co-star of a, a small film or maybe even a, a non-union feature film that's going to show what you can do as an actor. And that's what an agent, and that's what a producer is going to be interested in. And then when they ask, hmm, well, my film's union, and you're still non-union, even though you're really good, you can pull that piece of paper out and say, I'm SAG eligible. I can, or I can go down there and join in one hour if you want to hire me. Mm -hmm. So well, that's the point where you play that card. But a lot of people don't know that. They think it's prestigious to join the union. What happens then is if you join the union and you're offered the lead in a non-union film, you no longer can do that film, you know. You're, you're playing by their rules now, which is the Global Rule 1, which says I won't do non-union work. And so you've just cut all these opportunities off for yourself. I mean, I'm just giving you a couple of illustration of a couple of things. Uh, we yeah. have things that are called casting director workshops, where people are struggling to get cast and thing go to because they think they're going to meet a casting director, a Hollywood casting director. And granted, you go, and they're there, and they critique your work, but most actors that pay to go to these things and they can be anywhere from 50 bucks to 300 dollars and you're getting critiqued by a maybe a major casting person what they don't know is they're thinking it's a casting opportunity and if this person likes me they're going to cast me in something and i'm going to be working next week well that's not how it works uh in california anyway with california labor code laws and they preclude uh casting directors hiring people directly from these events why? Because wow. you paid to go there. So what would that mean? It just means you paid for that job. That violates California Labor Code.
No you know, even to go on an audition, that's why it can't even be an audition. You, you know, it's just like in real life. You don't pay to go on inner job interviews or job auditions. Uh, that's violating labor code usually. But if you were actually hired and you paid, uh, the person who you paid the money to, which would be the casting director, is in a lot of trouble with the state. But do they tell actors that? No. Most actors I know have gone to probably five or ten of those for their somebody clues them in going, you know, you can't be hired from this. Oh, you know, boy. thing is the benefit of that casting director's wisdom, and, you know, maybe they can help you out on doing your readings or your auditions a little bit better and give you some suggestions, but they're not even really allowed to take your headshots away. Anything that links them back <laughs> to potentially hiring you from... You know, this event where you paid to go to, they don't want anything to do with that. Mm. And, well, you know, unfortunately, there's just so many little things like that, and that's what I'm talking about. That's the business of acting, are all these little bugaboos that actors don't find out about. Usually when they find out about it, it's after they've paid four or five times. And that's our goal, is to sort of make actors aware of what these are. You know, and they're kind of a gray area, because maybe you should go once or twice to feel the heat of trying to perform and get your mouth open in front of a really top-notch casting director, but with the knowledge that you're not going to be hired, that you're just going there for a learning experience, and that's all that it can be. Yeah, well, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, so, so important, Actors Journey. And everyone, we've been speaking with, with, with Stan Livingston, stanleylivingston.com, uh, stanleylivingstonart.com, Actors Journey. Um, Stan, I... I, I could talk for another two hours, and I really, really, really appreciate you coming on. You're, you're such a big part, like I said, of so many of our generations uh, growing up on with your TV show, and now with the actor's journey, you play such an important role with, with newer actors. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on, Stan. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Steve. And, uh, yeah, thanks for letting me uh, talk about all these topics, and hopefully we can do some good out there and get some actors on the right path and... Uh, like I said, I always enjoy talking about my other sons. Now that mm. I know how much it means to everybody, or at least the ones yes. who are for the show. Yeah. Well, thank you, Stan, and uh, continued success. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>